Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India interrogations of the nations from different perspectives uh, and we looked at some writers who have interrogated the nation. In this unit we will look at writers who talk about uh, the reality of borders uh, which contest the idea of nations and uh, which reveal a b world in the past which was a borderless world where boundaries could be crossed and the, these words uh, also have become uh, possible now in the era of globalization. But the basic uh, mm, argument that I am trying to make here is that unlike the era of the nation, nation unlike the period of modernity and the, uh, the, the heyday of na nationalism, this rea this presence of boundaries as opposed to borders which pr permitted the flow of people ideas trade finance and so on was a reality as much as in the pre national world as it is in the present uh, borderless world of globalization and the writers who have uh, tried to narrate this reality this these overlapping boundaries between national boundaries, the flows of the movements of people across national boundaries, which interrogate the boundaries of the nation. Uh, uh, we would look at some of those writers, unlike the writers who helped in uh, narrating the narrative of the nation, we find that the, this group of writers is contesting the idea of the nation through revealing the presence of these overlapping boundaries. So, I call these writers cosmopolitans of the borderless world and uh, look, I look at cosmopolitanism as, uh, as, a, as a concept or as a notion, an idea that questions essentialist boundaries of the past, it questions the idea of identities, nations, cultures as organic and rooted and it calls attention to to, to uh, narratives of migrancy and indeterminacy, and as opposed to national nationalism, we look at globalization. Now, I borrow Ulf Hanner's idea of uh, cosmo uh, in his essay "Cosmopolitans and Locals in World Culture" to distinguish between locals and cos cosmopolitans, as Hanner puts it. Uh, normally, we understand locals as those who stay at home and we look at cosmopolitans as those who move, but here we are not equating movement with physical movement, but we are also looking at psychological movement. So, those who move physically may not move at all and whereas, those who move psychologically actually move without moving. I weave it together with Sigmund Bauman's idea of tourists and vagabonds of the two kind of people who move in the present borderless space and he calls them tourists and vagabonds. He distinguishes between the tourists and vagabonds uh, as uh, those who tourists, he defines tourists as locals who travel, but with the attitude of home plus. On the other hand, vagabonds, because of uh, sheer contingency, they are forced to penetrate the local because they are not, uh, uh, they do not have the luxury of moving between the non places of hotels, uh, office complexes, airports, um, um, shopping malls, and so on. And they, because of uh, the economic constraints, they are uh, forced to take buses, they are more forced to live in the more interior areas of a city, and that makes them come into contact with 
the local people and penetrate the local in the way tourists cannot tra penetrate. So, uh, we look at cosmopolitans as people who dwell and travel in cultural places that flow across borders. And uh, we, uh, these are uh, the writers and as well as individuals who question the shadow lines across modern states. They also question the myth of lost origins or homelands and they engage with the ongoing histories of migration and transnational flows. Uh, we are looking at diaspora cultures and we are looking at the idea of dwelling in travel, the idea of dwelling in travel and flows across borders and we are not looking at borders as uh, transitional zones, but we are looking at borders as sites of creative cultural production, uh, which, uh, which, are s which denote movement, travel and intercultural crossings. We are also looking at dwelling in travel as opposed to the earlier movement of people in the pre-global or pre-national era in the era of globalization, everyone is on the move producing a culture of circulation. So, when we look at the boundaries of movements across boundaries, we look at the boundaries within the Indian Ocean and across the Indian Ocean and we find uh, maybe there, there would be several other reasons, but four main reasons for the movements which took place across these boundaries. So, conquest, trade, endangerment and travel are generally agreed to be the reasons the drivers for movement. And now, we look at the novelist who uh, forms the reality of these boundary crossings in the not only in the present but he returns to an earlier era, the pre-global or pre-national era to talk about how people, goods, ideas traveled across the boundaries of physical and geographical boundaries of regions, nations and came into contact with one another. So, he testifies to the presence or existence of contact zones as much in the past as they are in the present. So, his first novel, The Circle of Reason, is about a weaver fleeing to North Africa. In a later non-fiction work, in an antique land, he traced the story of perhaps the world's first overseas Indian, a slave slo sold to a merchant in Egypt. So, those of us, we have been talking about, uh, about uh, the, uh, an insular, insular nation uh, and, uh, sec uh, and zones of seclusion where people did not come into uh, contact with ana one another. The presence of these uh, uh, individuals or groups uh, and the tracing of the archives which, uh, which confirm the presence of these contact zones through the movements of people who would we least expect to travel shows that the contact zones did exist in the past and the nation far from being an insulated secluded zone was an, a site of multiple uh, interactions between people from different parts of the world. We, when we go to the next novel in the glass palace, Gosha's glass palace where he recounts the journey of the story of Burma during the last century seen through the eyes of a young boy who grows up to become a trader. So, in the glass palace, uh, it is a, a movement within South Asia, uh, uh, because the boundaries uh, within the British Empire with between India and Burma were not, were quite permeable and Burma was one of the earlier sites of Indian migration not only of traders, but also of uh, seafarers, of uh, policemen and a whole lot of people who uh, we can call subaltern cosmopolitans as opposed to the elite cosmopolitans like this often young boy called Raj Kumar who finds his way to Burma and becomes a rich trader and through his eyes we see this.
movement of non-elite people like boatmen, laskars, ordinary folks who traveled. With the sea of poppies in 2008 and river of smoke in 2011, Ghosh has created the saga of individuals tossed around the world by waves of economic forces and how in the process they shape language and culture, linking indentured laborers in one part of the world with mercantilist traders in the city who want to keep China addicted to co-opium. So it's in Ghosh's novel that we have a wonderful and an amazing documentation of the 19th century movement of labor from India, from uh, villages of Bihar and UP to Mauritius, one of the earliest migrations from India. Uh, and we have a brilliant uh, recounting of the opium trade, which brings together unlikely people on the ship which set, sails, set sail for Mauritius, forming new forms of community, new forms of subjectivity and people who dwell in travel. Uh, in it, but it's in his, uh, one of his early novels, The Shadow Lines, that Amitabh Ghosh had first contested the idea of the boundaries of nations and the idea of borders as artificial, as shadow lines. Uh, I quote from the text uh, from the first person narrator when he talks about the, the boundaries between the present day Bangladesh and India and how these artificial shadow lines drawn between people who shared a culture, who shared a language, who shared an identity, uh, uh, create, uh, destroyed these syncretic shared boundaries which existed in India in until 1947 with the formation of Pakistan. What what had they felt, I wondered, when they had discovered that they would created not a separation, but a yet undiscovered irony. The irony that killed Pradeep, a character in the story, the simple fact that there had been a moment in the 4,000 year old history of that map when the places we know as Dhaka and Calcutta were more closely bound to each other than after they had drawn their lines. So closely that I in Calcutta had only to look into the mirror to be in Dhaka, a moment when each city was the inverted image of the other, locked into an irreversible symmetry by the line that was to set us free, our looking class border. So being a writer, there is no better way of putting, putting the uh, talking about the uh, uh, ridiculousness of forming boundaries between two cultural entities which have a much older history of sharing rather than of fragmentation. And uh, once again when, um, uh, the, the, the when we talk about contesting the boundaries or borders created by the partition of India in 1947, the consternation of a character in the shadow lands in Amitabh Ghosh's novel, a character called uh, Tama, or which means grandmother, who is originally from Dhaka, who con considers Dhaka as a homeland. And uh, she is forced to migrate to India in 1947. And when she gets an opportunity to travel back to Dhaka uh, several years later, she wonders what are, if there are any borders between uh, between Calcutta and Dhaka and if there are actual borders, boundary lines which separate the two regions. And she is totally flummoxed and totally flabbergasted that there are no real physical boundaries between the two nations. She, is, she expresses her consternation in these words when she says, and if there is no difference, both sides would be the same. It will be just like it used to be before when we used to catch a train to Dhaka and get off at Calcutta the next day without anyone stopping us. So the idea that borders are political rather than real, borders are political rather than physical and they are imaginary. What was it all for? So we can ask the same question along with Tama uh, 
what was it all for then? Partition and all the killing and everything. If there isn't anything in between, but there is nothing in between because there is no, there is more culture, cultural contiguity between Dhaka and Calcutta than between Calcutta and Delhi, and there is more cultural contiguity between Amritsar and Lahore than between Amritsar and Calcutta. So, in uh, CU Foppies, uh, uh, after having interrogated the bound borders of nations in his earlier novel, The Shadow Li Lines, Ghosh moves on in the Sea of uh, Poppies to talk about to talk about the histories of migration, and uh, moves into the era of uh, talks about globalization in an era much before globalization. The characters of my new book, he said, in an interview, may be different. The setting different, the time period different, but it's not unlike my other books because it also focuses on migration as with his early no other novels, which focus on migration, Sea of Poppies also focuses on migration. I've been writing about migration and exodus long before globalization. This is very important. Um, as as uh, the very beginning, I pointed out that those of us who thought that globalization began in the late 90s or late 80s or in the 90s, we are mistaken because these <coughs> uh, the, the way we define globalization, those variables, those parameters of globalization, if we apply to an earlier era, we find that those parameters as are as true for that era as they are for now, and they predate the history of globalization. It's the reality of my times. This is what he said in an interview to the Asian Times. And he said, in the Sea of Poppies, I'm trying to see these global movements of people in a historical perspective. Sea of Poppies, he calls a historical novel about migration, both past and present. Don't call it rootlessness or alienation from the mother culture. Those are negative words. So uh, we are looking at how the histories of migration, as narrated and uh, immortalized in Ghosh's novels, contest the idea of nationalism and point to a borderless world. They contest the idea of state-centric boundaries. They contest the idea of nations as discrete, separate, uh, disconnected identi uh, entities and show how the different nation states or different geographical regions are connected through these histories of migration of people and also of goods. So I don't think migration signifies one thing, he says. There are so many reasons why migration takes place. It could be economic, it could be social, or even be related to education. Every middle class Indian has a cousin abroad. For instance, everyone on Goa has either worked abroad or has relatives outside the country. That's the kind of reality people are living now. So in his novels, Koch directly addresses this movement of people which Arjun Apadurai uh, put so memorably in his idea of escapes. Now I call these movements, uh, now when we talk about movements of people or migration, we tend to focus on the migration of elite professionals. We tend to focus on elite movements of professionals, intellectuals, artists in the present global context, as well as in the past when we talk about the older histories of migration, we talk uh, about high profile uh, migrants such as kings, prince, princess, uh, students, um, political leaders and so on. But we don't, uh, the, the histories of the ordinary people who move, such as Laskars, Ayas, soldiers, those histories have been marginalized when we talk about the history of migration. Uh, Ghosh's novels show the non-elite movements of, uh, non-elite movements, not just of urban, but also of rural, of working class and women in the past. Uh, the idea of uh, the nation has increasingly been uh, contested in theories of globalization, particularly 
in Anzaldua's idea of borders, this uh, theory of borders, and which looks at uh, borders as shadow lines and insists on the porosities of cultural boundaries. And it, in light of these, in view of these, it's uh, impossible for for us to think of culture as a self-contained whole. Instead, what we see is a porous array of intersections where distinct processes cross from within and beyond its borders. So the idea of a culture as a self-contained whole is proved to be a myth, is revealed to be a myth by writing of this kind. Instead, it shows array of intersections where distinct processes cross from within and beyond its borders. Now, as Neelam Srivastava has suggested, syncreticism can be viewed as an alter alternative to a monocultural, monoreligious nation. And this perspective, this idea of syncreticism or syn syncretic boundaries has come from some of the new writing in English as well as in Indian languages. So the idea of cultural sep separateness and historical, historical, historically situated subjectivities, and there's a need for South-South dialogues, the movements within the South, the movements which were not mediated by the West, which were outside the dragnet of imperial movements, these movements need to be investigated and it's to Amitabh Ghosh's credit that he has focused our attention of on these movements, not the movements from the non-West to the West and the West to the non-West, but movements within South Asia, within uh, the East, and within the Global South that have been marginalized in histories of migration and diasporas. In an antique land, he, he w it was the first novel in which he talked about those small, indistinguishable, intertwined histories, Indian and Egyptian, Muslim and Jewish, Hindu and Muslim, which have been partitioned long ago. And Go shows that how these histories had always been indistinguishable, had been, had been intertwined not only but Hindu and Muslim, but Indian and Egyptian, Muslim and Jewish. So we look at uh, uh, when uh, syn we look at syncreticism, which underpins all of his writing, and uh, also it points to a search for an alternative history to the segregationist narratives that aim to align this common past in order to promote the cause of religious separatism. It also calls attention to globalizations. We have focused so far on globalizations from above, but we also looked at several instances of globalization from below when we looked at the movements of the Roma people. We looked at the subaltern, uh, the, the, the non-elite singers who have become global celebrities. We looked at several forms of globalization from below. We looked at the networks formed by uh, uh, cable operators, by uh, the so-called pirates to exchange uh, cultural um, forms such as music and films. So when we look at this globalization from below, if we look at one idea of globalization as homogenization of the planet from above, it coexists with the globalization from below. And Ghosh's uh, writing uh, narrates these several instances of globalization from below in all his novels, such as The Circle of Reason, The Glass Palace, The Sea of Poppies, The Hungry Tide. Each of these novels engages with the histories of globalization. And it also engages with these histories of globalization, which are movements of uh, to which uh, which is uh, which focuses on the movements of non elite people non elite movements of rural people of the working classes to places we couldn't have imagined uh, so Bolton co uh, cosmopolitans uh, we see in the circle of reason for instance the main character the weaver alu 
and all other characters who land up in the soup. The glass palace, this little orphan boy called Rajkumar who finds his way into uh, Burma and the, the maid, the princess's maid Dolly who, who, who travels to India and the sea of poppies we have a rural woman who by, f by, f uh, by the vagaries of fate lands tra finds herself traveling in a ship. A woman who has never seen a ship has a dream of a nightmare about a ship and that is a premonition, premonition of things that are going to unfold at the, uh, in the course of the novel. And the lowest of these denominators when we look at the travelers we meet in Amitabh Ghosh's novels is this unnamed slave in an antique land who confirms the history of movement from, from India. Uh, a, a movement of a person who is a, at the bottom of, the, of all forms of hierarchy finding his way in tra finding himself traveling in different parts of the world testifies to these histories of globalization from below. So when we look at circulations, we look at this oceanic trade in of uh, 12th century AD of coastal regions uh, to Middle East. We look at the move circulations of Laskars like Rajkumar. We look at the uh, movements of indentured workers like Diti. Uh, soldiers like Diti's husband, Indian soldiers in Burma and Singapore and then we move to the more recent circulations, the more recent migrations caused by the artificial creation of borders after the partition of 1947 and the movement of displaced people to Morich Chapi and to Sundarbans in Amitabh Ghosh's novels. So with this uh, we uh, close uh, this uh, discussion on uh, how the Indian novel uh, both in languages, in the bhashas and also in English is initially complicit in the imagining of the nation, but after a period of time there is discontent with the nation voiced by different writers which, le uh, which, uh, which, which uh, reaches, uh, which culminates in the, in the publication of Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children and then onward though the Midnight's Children is published before the official onset of globalization, the first novel which contested the idea of uh, na nations and showed the nations to be narrations or myths and in the writing of Amitabh Ghosh and several others we see how we, we, we look at novelists and we look at characters who are not locals but who are cosmopolitans of a borderless world.